In this video, I want to talk about linguistic style and identity performance in a little bit more depth than we were able to do in our module three meeting and that the chapter in the textbook was able to go into. So we talked a little bit in class about the difference between culture and identity. And there's a lot of different, obvious definitions from different scholars and different ways to think about this. but. One distinction that I want to draw here is the distinction between performance and performativity. Now, this builds on the work of uh, Austin Searle, who is talking about performatives in language, things that get called into existence as we speak, such as, I now pronounce you man and wife, this new status, or I hereby knight you, kingdom or knight of the realm, or I hereby christen this ship. So these are things that, like, the legal status, something actually changes in the world by our speaking alone. Our speaking calls something new in the world into existence. And Judith Butler um, in the early 90s applied this to gender as well, arguing that gender was always a performative, that gender was not just being performed, there wasn't just a difference between men and women's behavior because they were men and women, but rather that gender was being called into being via our performances, um, and that it existed only as a result of our performances in the interpretations and in the perceptions of those around us, rather than something that inherently or necessarily pre-existed a conversation. And this view of performativity has since been applied to other forms of identity as well. So I'm going to set up a contrast between culture and identity here. So in this sort of view, culture is a communal practice which individuals get socialized into. And that's something we discussed uh, in, the, in the book about language socialization, that we move from being a peripheral member to a core member, from an outsider um, to an insider, from a newcomer to an old timer via observing how things are done, maybe getting feedback or being apprenticed, but eventually we're able, able to expertly execute those behaviors which are key for being recognized as a core member of a culture. So we're getting socialized into these practices. Whereas identity in this sort of view is, is more a set of belongings, um, a set of affiliations, which an individual to some extent chooses to call to the surface. So to some extent chooses, there can be identities um, which it's hard to escape by virtue of our birth or the situation into which we were born. Um, but at any given moment, we're choosing to re-identify with those things in some ways that we can call those to the surface or to downplay them uh, for many kinds of identities. And if you want to go into a more depth about the different kinds of identities, biographical identities, um, there's there's more work that can be done on this. And I've got an article by Suresh Kanagaraja that I can share with you about that. Um, and culture would be more about the practices which are external to the body. Um, from an anthropological view, a culture which is something that has to be observed via external anthropologists try really hard to never read into the thought processes of uh, the people being studied. Rather, focus on descriptions of external practices. Um, and these practices, which are often external to the body, are shared by many. It could lead to internal commitments, like by virtue of the fact that I'm engaging in the practice of a certain culture, that I've been socialized into a certain culture, I could then have an eternal affinity for this culture, an internal commitment to it, um, but that the, the practices and the socialization of practices kind of comes first. And then as I become more of other groups, I'm internally committed. Whereas in performativity approaches, because identity are internal commitments um, to, and the judgments of these really imagined communities, that identity is always about imagination. Like I'm choosing to identify with certain kinds of people, or I'm setting up an imagined version of the kind of person that I identify with. Um, what is the, the typical member or the hypothetical member? Um, Bakhti you know, called this a super addressee, sort of an imagined version of a person that I'm really speaking to. And then these internal commitments get enacted via my practices, called into being via my practices. Um, practices are just a way of showing, making those commitments real or making those identities come to the surface in a given interaction. So in this culture view, language reflects my culture. I came up in a certain group or I, I was raised in a certain group. I was brought up in a certain group. 
And the way that I use language is going to reflect that culture. And language in this view is often used as a noun. It's often, you know, are saying like, okay, this is a language, or this is a dialect, or this is a style. And it's the language that matches culture X, that matches group X. This is the dialect that matches group X. This is the style that matches group X. And so because I'm a member of that culture, uh, that group, obviously I'm going to end up languaging that way because that's how people do it. So the, the, the culture really comes first, and then like the language reflects those cultural affiliations. In performativity approaches, language is actually the thing that creates my identity, and languaging is often used here as a verb. I'm languaging my identity into being. It's, it's very much an activity, an ephemeral activity, um, and these identities can sort of flit in and out. They can be fleeting, uh, they can be enduring, but they depend on, on language for action, for presence. Um, and these identities get called into being in the mind of the audience in a given situation. That identity is inherently a performance. Like if there's no one to watch your performance, if there's no one to judge your performance, there is no identity. Identity is in some ways always done for other people to be believed by others. Um, whether people who share that identity, I want them to believe my identity so that they will affiliate with me. Or... Uh, people who do not share it, and I want them to believe my identity to create sort of disaffiliation from each other. But the, the languaging is always strategic, and an identity is always done for an audience in this view. In the culture sort of view or performance, like I'm performing my lingua culture, if you can identify me as a member of a culture by my speech, by the way I talk, it's because I was socialized into this. Uh, this is how I came up. And the way that I speak gives me away. Oh, you can tell that I'm a Midwesterner. Oh, you can tell that I'm a Detroiter because that came out of my mouth. Like, ah, uh, the way that I language, I can't help it. The way that I language, it just gives me away. Like, you're, you're going to tell that I'm a member of this group based on the way that I speak. It's, it's kind of seen as being below my control because I've been so thoroughly socialized into using language that way. Whereas in a performativity approach, if you identify me as a member of a group by my speech, it's really because you bought my performance. It's not that my performance is giving me away, you know, as revealing what I already was. I'm actually doing it so that you'll believe that I am this thing, just like an actor on a stage. Um, do you believe that an actor is this person or do you not? Do you always do you see right through it that this person is just acting? You have to buy my performance and recognize it as an authentic or as a valid performance in order for that identity to work, in order for that identity to be believed. Um, so in the culture of view, identity is a byproduct of socialization into a group and having control over its authentic practices. And, and these, they're so under my control that they're often unconscious or subconscious. Whereas in performativity, identity depends on the judgment of my audience primarily. Um, I could identify as X all that I wanted, but if no one believes me, if no one buys that identification, I ultimately am not an X. Um, and I'm going to try to strategically deploy the language patterns which are associated with that identity in order for you to believe me, in order for you to buy my performance. So on the left, basically, this is kind of first and second wave sociolinguistics. On the right is third wave sociolinguistics. Sociolinguistics is the study of language and identities. Um, of It's basically kind of like uh, identity and ideology of language. So language is used um, by social groups for social ends. It's a very fascinating field. And in the rest of this video, I'm going to briefly cover some of the history of sociolinguistics and talk a little bit about this identity performance. So in this view here on the left, these concentric circles, um, I'm socialized into a performance. Uh, I have moved from the periphery to the core, moved from the outside to the inside. And so at the center is a checklist of things that I would have to check off, be able to do expertly in order to be seen as and judged as a core member of that culture. Um, let's use the example of the pronoun y'all. Uh, y'all is a second person plural pronoun. Um, it's often associated with the south of the United States, but people use it in other parts of the country as well. But if I was growing up in the south and I wanted to be 
welcomed as a member, a full-fledged member of Southern American society. The use of the pronoun y'all would be a strategic thing for me to be socialized into, and I probably couldn't help it if I grew up in the South. I would end up using y'all because that's the the pronoun that all of the people around me had always been using. So I would be performing my Southerness by my use of the pronoun y'all, and in some ways I couldn't help it, um, but that would be a performance that's being performed and you would judge it. Strategic performativity, this would be the case of like, maybe I didn't grow up in a world in which y'all was the only form that was used. Maybe I'm aware of other variants, and now I have a choice. I could use y'all, or I could use you guys, or I could just use you, or yins, or you all. There's other options that I have. But there's times that I'm going to strategically deploy y'all the way I've got an image here of a, a carrier deploying a missile, that it's strategic. So, and this will often be done because there's an indexical link between a language choice and an identity. So if someone chooses y'all and then people in, around me believe, oh, y'all is used by Southerners, y'all correlates with Southerness. Then there could be pre-existing ideologies about Southerners themselves. Um, some people might have the ideology that Southerners are friendly people. Others might say, oh, Southerners are prejudiced people. Because of these ideologies in my audience, if I use y'all, I could end up creating the sense of the fact that people who use y'all are friendly or people who use y'all are prejudiced, and I don't really know what my audience is going to think. I have really little control over how they're going to identify me if I use the pronoun y'all. So if I use y'all, there's an indexical link that might differ from person to person. Y'all could make me sound friendly, but y'all could also make me sound prejudiced. And I could intend to deploy it in order to create a friendly persona, to create an identity of a relaxed, friendly, um, intimate person, but it could backfire on me because in your mind, with your associations, y'all actually indexes backwardness or, or prejudicedness. And I, I have little control over that. My performance only works if you buy the performance that I'm making. And so it doesn't really matter what I intended, what I choose to do with my language, I, if the audience themselves doesn't receive it in the way that I intended. This would be a performativity approach to language. So in first wave of sociolinguistics, basically they were studying regional variation, saying, oh, you use language that way because you're from place X. X people live in place X, so they use language X. Um, because you're from Spain or because you're from Catalonia, you're going to end up using language that way. Or because you're from the north or the south or this town or that town, your language is going to give you away as being from that place. Um, it started to get a little bit more complex when they realized it's not just about place, but that even within a place, uh, which socioeconomic class you're in is going to result in different kinds of language use, which ethnic or racial group you're in may end up correlating with different uses of language. Gender may end up correlating with different uses of language. And they started to look at other different variables where they could establish a mathematical correlation with language. So in second wave sociolinguistics, basically you got to say, okay, you're part of a community of practice and you use language the way that you do because you're part of this community of practice X and also taking into account what the situation is. You're part of this community of practice and it's a careful situation or a formal situation. So you're going to use language a certain way. They started looking at language variation to that extent. And this is where um, audience design theory by Alan Bell sort of came into being in the early 80s based off an earlier seminal work um, by Goffman about impression management, basically saying there's lots of different ways that language can vary. There's lots of different factors which influence language variation. And he studied radio announcers and how their language changed based on who they were speaking with, the context in which they were speaking. He noticed that one individual radio announcer actually controlled a pretty wide array of language styles that they could use with different people on the radio show. And they also noticed that how the radio announcers spoke really depended on who was present. Were they speaking to a particular person? Was there someone else in the room who maybe wasn't the actual guest being interviewed, but still had some effect on this, the way that the language happening? Were there overhearers, people who weren't present, but the speaker was still um, aware of their presence in some ways? Or even eavesdroppers, people for whom the speaker was completely unaware? All of these different levels of audience had different effects on the way that language was being used by a person. 
Um, I'm going to use a little story for this. So I was on a bus once at the University of South Carolina, and I was sitting right next to you on the same bench as two women uh, who were on the bus. And they were having this long conversation about how horrible men were and what an awful thing men were. But I was sitting right next to them, and there was actually several other men who were kind of standing all around them. And if they had been aware of or trying to design for us, you know, these women actually never made eye contact with any of the men. They never sort of ratified our presence, like acknowledged that we were there. So in some ways, we were invisible. We were an unratified over here. They knew we existed because they could see us, but we had never been acknowledged. So they didn't have to adjust their way of speaking for our account. They were creating a way of speaking for each other um, as the addressee. So the addressee is the person who you're specifically addressing in a conversational turn, um, looking with your eyes, what the names you're using, the pronouns that you use, the one who's back channeling, the one who's often saying, uh huh, oh yeah, totally, yeah, right, right. That person is the addressee. The auditor has the attention of the speaker and has the right to start speaking at any given moment, even if they're not a person being addressed. Then there are overhearers. These are people who are visible but are neither the addressee nor the auditor. It would be extremely rare and maybe even rude if they started to speak, if they barged their way into the role of auditor. A ratified means at some point this person acknowledged, the speaker acknowledged these people, and unratified over here is our people who are never acknowledged by the speaker, then eavesdroppers would be invisible if you overheard a conversation in another room and they had no idea that you were there. Um, they're not going to design their language to take you into account, but they may take into account that there could be a potential eavesdropper and speak in a certain way or leave some things unsaid, certain taboo subjects being avoided. So each of these different roles has an effect on the way that language is being done. This is all part of um, second wave sociolinguistics that we're, we're designing for the audience in a way you can see it shifting toward the third wave that we're, we're designing for the audience that we're trying to be strategic about our language use depending on who is there depending on who is around um, if Barack Obama walked into a room where you were having a conversation with someone else um, and you knew that he could hear you um, even if he were just an overhearer, that would probably significantly change the kind of language you're using, what you were talking about, how you were using language. That's an example of audience design. What both the first and second wave shared, though, is that your identity resides within you. Your identity is in you as part of biography, as part of socialization, that this is just because you were born where you were born, because you were raised where you were raised, because you find yourself in the groups that you find yourself in, that this identity then was a part of you. It kind of came out of the fact that you had this culture. And your identity would shine through, through the spaces when you speak. And you could almost picture your language as being a crack through which other people could see your identity Based on the way you speak, people could discover facts about you, facts about your culture, facts about your biography, things that were, were true of you, the ways communities that you had even chosen to, voluntarily to be socialized into, that would be revealed by the way that you use language. So your language performance may come out in different colors. You may have very many different styles. So someone who's part of Dutch culture writ large may have very many different styles of language they could use, or someone who's part of miss graduate student culture could have many different styles that would all be part but they come from that same source of light which is my pre-linguistic identity the identity i have before i start speaking in on into the third wave of sociolinguistics uh Miriam Meyerhoff and Nancy Nijelski kind of had this different model they began to be influenced by Judith Butler's ideas and really see i'm always interacting with you as someone I'm not just interacting with you as Thor. I'm interacting with you as Thor the teacher, or Thor the American, or Thor the male. Thor, I, there's going to be some other epithet, and I, I'm aware of who I'm interacting with you as. And who I'm interacting with you as shapes, in some ways, the language choices that I make. So the, the many different identities become relevant or turned to the front. It's almost they visualized it like a basketball. Picture a basketball with lots of sticky notes on the outside of the basketball, each sticky note having a different identity. And I could rotate uh, one of these identities to the fore. Um, if I started, if my maleness somehow became relevant in the conversation, or if I made it relevant, that might call your genderedness also to the forefront. If my Americanness became relevant to the conversation, that might call your nationality to the forefront. Um, if my
Midwesternness uh, became relevant to the conversation. I started speaking as a Midwesterner. That might call your Southernness or your Westernness or your Northeasternness to the forefront and affect the way that you would speak. So it could be a corresponding identity or it could be a different identity, but an identity that matches sort of at the same level. So I did a study of a Facebook friend, I'm going to call him Rodrigo, and in his Facebook posting, sometimes he was claiming you know, to be act acting as him or taking on very personal identities, such as Rodrigo the neighbor or Rodrigo the nice guy. But there were also times that he was speaking as a member of his group identities, as a Jewish person, as a Latino, as someone who lived in Washington, D.C., as a man, as an Argentine, someone from Argentina, as a 20-something. And that the way that language was being used in his posts varied depending on which of these identities was sort of coming to the fore and the other conversations that he was engaged in with a corresponding identity. If the conversation turned to religion, the Jewishness maybe was moved to the forefront because we're talking about religious identity or if if the cities of our residents moved to the forefront of the conversation, it kind of called forth his Washingtonianness. Um, so basically, this rotating of the basketball with sticky note identities around it is sort of a step toward this idea of performing an identity. I'm rotating around, I'm calling it into being through my language. So if performance of identity assumed the identity was already inside me and shining out through the cracks of my language, in a performativity view, I'm using language this way in this moment because I want to come across as X. So this is basically self-design. Or I'm using language this way in this moment because I think that you want me to come across as X. So I'm designing for you what you want. Um, all of my colors, my identities are on the outside here of this jar. It's like I'm almost like a chameleon. I can change my colors in order to fit in to either how I want to present myself or how I think you want me to present myself. I could even ironically use another person's language in order to show that I'm not X. So I could sarcastically use the language of a group that I'm not a part of in order to disaffiliate from X, which is itself a form of self-design, a form of showing who I am. The, the markers would have to be pretty clear, though, that I was using it ironically. Otherwise, I risk a misjudged performance. So performativity, as I said at the beginning, these are these things of hereby calling it into being. Um, in some ways, this has been challenged. So one critique of this is that maybe I'm not always designing for the audience, trying to match you, but designing for me. This is a view of all your needs or opinions be damned. And sometimes that seems to be the case. So this idea of always designing for others or that my identity depends on its believability. Um, a lot of people resist that idea. They don't like it. But most people, if pushed, will understand that to some extent identity has to at least be a dance between the two parties. Um, if I identify as something um, but my identity is not believed by anyone, can I really identify as that? There has to be some aspect of audience or believability. Suresh Kanagraja, you've heard me refer to many times, sort of also then re-criticized some of these criticisms, that this focus of speaking into being, which uh, became sort of more popular in the 2000s, that it's all about self-design. This was sort of a popular view with the early rise of social media, like Twitter, Instagram, where, you know, it was seen that, like, oh, there is no actual audience for whom the person is designing. They're designing for a hypothetical or imaginary audience, which may or may not even exist. And yet these individuals are curating their self-presentation, their self-design. Um, but Kanagaraja sort of refocused on listening into being, that really it is listening that calls identities into being, listening and analyzing, that an identity does depend on the presence of some kind of hearer. They have to ratify that identity. If there's no listener or interpreter, there's no performative. You know, I could... If there's no one to hear me say, I hereby pronounce you man and wife, I hereby knight you uh, the knight of the realm, <laughs> I hereby christen this ship, um, it, it's not a true legal action. Like There has to be an audience, there has to be witnesses sort of for that to work. And so it's all of this kind of question of, like, does identity pre-exist an interaction? Uh, if identity pre-exists an interaction, then I have the right to identify as X, um, whether anyone believes it or not, or is there or not, 
But if there's a, if identity is really based on listening, the identity can't entirely depend on the will of the speaker. Identity has to depend on the presence of the others. And this is, I think, an interesting point for intercultural communication, that we often have learned to identify and actively try to identify as certain characteristics, a certain persona, a certain group, a um, certain personality via our language. But those attempts may be very unsuccessful um, if the person we're talking to has a totally different scheme, a totally different system of interpretation. And I could say, well, I was trying to be friendly in that interaction, but that would be a fallacious statement. There's no such thing as me trying to be friendly. Friendliness can only exist if that's perceived and ratified by my listener. It doesn't matter my intention of friendliness. It only matters whether the listener actually agreed that I authentically performed friendliness in a way that they could recognize. That's the only case in which my friendliness actually matters. So all of this is interesting, right? It's an interesting dive into style. I know this is a little in-depth, theoretical, esoteric, but I think some of you would be interested in this journey um, of the field of sociolinguistics and identity. And if you have any other questions about this, I would be happy to interact with you further. Thank you so much.